I know I've been changed, oh I, I know I've been changed, oh I, oh, <laughs> you, you startled me, <laughs> but you know after what happened the other day, nothing should really surprise me anymore. Now, <laughs> I guess you're wondering what happened the other day. Well. I don't mind telling you, in fact, I've been telling anyone who would listen. It, it, it was my, uh, as was my usual, it, it was midday and, and, and I was on my way to the well to draw my water. Now I guess you're wondering why I would go to draw water in the heat of the day. Well. It was because of my neighbors, uh, the other women in the community. Uh, they, they shunned me for the way that I lived my life. Uh, they considered me an outcast. So, so I went to the well uh, in midday while they were home feeding their families. Now on this particular day, as I drew near, I was surprised to see a man sitting by the curb of the well. A stranger, a traveler, a what was all alone in the heat of the day. Hmm. And as I drew near, I heard him ask, Will you give me a drink of water? <laughs> Sir, I said, you are asking me to give you a drink of water? You, a, a Jew, and, and me, a Samaritan? Now, for those of you who may not be aware, the Jews do not have anything to do with us Samaritans. We are a mixed race of people. We are descended from marriages between the pagans and the few Israelites who remained after the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom. I cautiously Lord, my jug, and I feel the cup that was sitting by the well. And I, I gave it to him. <laughs> he drank thirstily. And then he gave it back to me. And when he did, he said, If you knew who it was, that has asked you for a drink, you would ask him for a drink, and he would give you living water. <laughs> living water, I laughed. How? You do not even have a, a bucket, and, and this well is deep. It was given to us by our forefather, Jacob. He, his children, and his cattle drink from it. Do you think that you are greater than Jacob? He smiled and said, Drink the water from this well, and you will thirst again. 
drink the water that I will give to you. And not only rising up from your very soul, giving you eternal life. Who was this man? Okay, I laughed. Give me this living water. I would love to. into my very soul as if he knew me better than I knew myself. Strangely, I, I was not frightened nor angry. And then he said, go. Go get your husband and bring him back to the well. Well, <laughs> reluctantly, I, I said, Sir, I do not have one. Right you are, he said, almost joyfully. <laughs> you have had five husbands. And the man that you're living with now is not your husband. So when you say that you do not have a husband, you are speaking the truth. How did he know this? And knowing it, why was he still talking to me? Everyone else shunned me for the way that I lived my life. Are you a prophet, I asked? Our forefathers say that we should worship here on the mountain, but you Jews say that we should worship in Jerusalem. He looked at me again and very softly he said, the time is coming when you will not worship here on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Salvation will come from the Jews. But the time is coming when you will not worship here on the mountain, nor in Jerusalem. The time is here, in fact, when you will, the true, you will. That is the type of worshiper that the Father is looking for. For you see, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Are you a prophet? I asked again. I was having a hard time understanding these new ideas. So I said, well, I do know that when the Messiah comes, he will tell us everything that we need to know. And then, with the most intense look, he said, I am he, the one who is speaking. I am he. And as he spoke those words, the chill left my body. 
that old gray feeling that I had always had, it was gone. I wanted to laugh. I wanted to cry. I wanted to just shrug off my body and just dance, dance, dance in my spirit. But before I could do anything, we were interrupted by the sound of the man's, the prophet's, no, the Messiah's companions coming. And as they came, they began to reprimand him for talking to a woman. So I left my jug at the well and I ran, I ran, I ran back to town and I told everyone, come, come, come see the man. Come see the man who has told me everything that I have ever done in my life. Come, you've got to come to the well. Do you suppose that he could be the Christ? Oh, I joyfully told everyone in the sound of my voice because I wanted them to have this, this, this living water to experience this overwhelming, unspeakable joy that I had. And do you know what? They came, men, women, children, whole families, they came to the well and they listened and they believed, not because of what I had said, but because of what he was saying. They believed. Well, I later learned two amazing things about that day. First, Jesus purposefully went out of his way even to come to Samaria. He said that he needed to be there. And do you remember when he said, I am he, the one who is speaking, I am he? Well, that was the first time that he had ever revealed himself as the Messiah. And he told me, a shunned woman, an outcast, he told me first. I know I've been changed, oh, I, I know I've been changed, I, I know I've been changed, angels in heaven didn't sign my name. Good morning, everyone. It has been my blessing to present to you this morning a monologue of the conversation between Jesus and a lone, unnamed woman who had come to the well to draw her water. I took it from the Gospel of, or it is written, from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. I presented this monologue for a couple of reasons, and if you will grace me with a few more minutes of your time and attention, I would like to tell you, to tell you, I would like to studying this book, this book. <laughs> Practicing Resurrection, the Gospel of Mark, and Radical Discipleship. In it, the author, Janet Wolfe, says that even though we don't hear much about them from the pulpit, 
there were many women disciples who accompanied Jesus from the beginning to the end of his life on earth. Their stories are written in all four of the Gospels. Wolf says that not only were they disciples, but that they were, as she describes them, radical disciples. They were radical in that their actions defied social and cultural norms. They stood up against established customs for their gender and behaved in different, unexpected ways. I and freedom for themselves and for others. And from the Gospel of Mark, the author describes the, the bravery that was shown by the woman disciple with the alabaster jar who pushed past the di other disciples, the male disciples, to anoint Jesus prior to his crucifixion. The audacity of the woman who reached out and touched Jesus' garment and the holy boldness of the Syrophoenician woman, who she, she cites all of these as examples of radical discipleship. And so from the Gospel of John, I have presented to you the Samaritan woman, as another example of radical discipleship. The Samaritan woman entered into debate with the man, Jesus. Women did not talk in such a manner to men. She boldly stated her understanding and questioned him until she was convinced that he was the Messiah. When she became a believer, she did not remain silent, nor did she speak only to women. She moved out into the public arena, into male space. This was bold, unaccustomed, unprecedented behavior for any woman, and certainly for a woman with a scandalous past. After her conversion, the Samaritan woman went back into her town and told everyone about Jesus so that others had the opportunity to listen, to believe, and to be saved. It could be and is often stated that the Samaritan woman was the first Christian evangelist because she was the first person who went out of her way by her own initiative to tell how Jesus the gospel of <laughs> that it was at the well when Jesus said, I am he, that he first revealed himself as the Messiah and that he told a woman first. This monologue also gives me an opportunity to tell you more about the Samaritan woman, something that you may not know, the rest of her story. While only the events of the Samaritan woman's encounter with Jesus are told in our Bible, an account of the rest of her life is available in the writings of Eastern Orthodox Church history. According to Eastern Christian tradition, she became a tireless evangelist, preaching Jesus as the Christ before and after her death. Her continuing witness brought so many to the Christian faith that she was given the status of equal 
to the apostles, and she is celebrated as a saint. She died a martyr when eventually her ministry came to the attention of Emperor Nero, and she was brought before him to answer for her faith. Refusing to disavow her belief in Jesus, she was tortured, and ironically, she was thrown into a dry well where she died. In our study book, author Janet Wolfe encourages women to reclaim this legacy of radical legacy, legacy of... of as we seek to fulfill our mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Now, I am one of the newer members of our United Methodist Women here at OUMC. But from what I am experiencing, I think that we will be just fine if we can just continue the excellent tradition of service by the women of this church. I just love to hear Dorothy Avery and Barb Clawson and Flo Fortney and others tell of the ministry that they have done and have experienced here at OUMC. I also believe that, is in, that it is important that we remember to celebrate what has been done and what is being done by United Methodist Women to assist God. And I would like to end by telling you how the Samaritan Woman monologue was used as part of a United Methodist Women's Outreach Project. Please be mindful that I'm going to try and tell you in two to three minutes about something that took a year or two of meetings, mind and soul searching discussion, planning and relationship building. In 2012, at the direction of Bishop Sally Dick, United Methodist in the Northern Illinois, Illinois Conference, where I attended, took on a Who Are My Neighbors project. We were asked to look into our church neighborhood and actively seek to connect with neighbors who were not affiliated with a church. Well, after much pro and con discussion, in addition to just the people living in the area, our United Methodist Women's Group decided to also focus on a local women's rescue and rehabilitation center. We expected that getting the women to come to our church would be a formidable task. After many meetings and a lot of prayer, we decided to see if we could get feedback from the women on a question, a question that we kept asking ourselves. If you were invited, why would you not come to our church? A group facilitator at the center presented the question to the women who were guests at that time. The feedback we received opened our eyes to many life situations and experiences that we were totally unaware of. And it caused us to have to pray for a non-judgmental spirit. But more importantly, it spoke to our hearts and it fueled our determination. One of the reasons given 
over and over again was, I don't want to hear any. It was finally decided that we would invite the women to a Saturday fellowship retreat and just focus on building relationships. At the same time, a good friend of mine, who is a wonderfully gifted and talented singer, actress, and playwright, was writing a series of monologues under the title, Candles in the Dark. The writings were about unnamed women in the Bible. The Samaritan woman was her first monologue and she had asked me to perform it in a local theater group that she directed. When she came to help us with planning the retreat, she suggested to come <laughs> might be a good closing activity. So we publicized the retreat with a promise of food, fun, and no preaching. On the morning of the retreat, I was really dismayed with the small attendance, but a more senior member just kept saying, trust God for the increase. And as the morning continued, more women came in. We had music and singing, along and singing. and jazzercise dancing. We played games and, and we gave prizes. We enjoyed an evening meal with fancy china and white linen tablecloths. And as a closing activity, in a dimly lit room, surrounded by a circle of women, I delivered the Samaritan woman monologue. And I am so, so blessed to tell you <clears throat> that this monologue accomplished more than any sermon ever could have. The Holy Spirit ministered in the way that only the Holy Spirit can. It was a wonderful, wonderful breakthrough experience for many of the women in attendance. Chains were broken, shields were shattered, grace and mercy abundantly prevailed. And when we think back on it, we marvel at it. joy to tell you that the 8th annual women's retreat was held a few weekends ago on October 12th and that some of the women who came for the first time in 2012 were there in the planning group for this year's retreat. But <laughs> Until I read our study book. And while it may not have been a radical action, it is an example of what can be accomplished with God's help when we open ourselves to different ways for accomplishing the UMW mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And I thank you, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share this ministry experience with you this morning. The word of God for the people of God.